Jack and Will's fight in Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, may be my favourite movie fight ever. Definitely in the top five, and you may think that's pretty heavy lifting for a fight in a movie based on a Disney ride, but trust me, it's just that good. My name is Jill Bearup, and when I'm not making YouTube videos, doing ridiculous things with my hair, or attempting early years education, my hobby is theatrical violence, the art of pretending to hurt people for stage and screen. And this is one of my favourite fights, because my preferences run in the direction of the small, the deeply character-connected, and the layered like lasagna. Like, the good kind of lasagna, not the kind which just has two lousy sheets of the stuff. The first Pirates movie is a ride pun fully intended. It buckles its swash and it goes like a summer blockbuster should. Albeit for slightly too long in my opinion, but it's glorious, wonderful, ridiculous, slightly creepy fun. The CGI holds up pretty well, the plot exists and is mostly coherent, and the cast are perfect, and perfectly set up for this scene. Will's introduction as a child is mysterious and brief, but it sets up the history between Will and Elizabeth. When Will is introduced again as an adult, we get a quick and thorough overview of his character. Painfully earnest, skilled as a blacksmith, in love with Elizabeth, kind of a dork, and unwilling to risk what he has, or to be more specific, unwilling to risk her. Elizabeth. You see that? That obviously cost him something. No matter how much he might be in love with Elizabeth, he is not willing to risk her reputation by being anything less than completely proper in public. So that's Will. To be honest though, a large part of this movie's charm, and one of the reasons it was such a big success, is Captain Jack Sparrow. Who, in this film at least, is delightfully over the top and surprisingly layered. I hear they're planning some kind of reboot without Captain Jack Sparrow. I also hear people have opinions on this, but I do not have an opinion on this because I haven't seen it yet. Jack's introduction in the first Pirates of the Caribbean is beautiful because, rather like the man himself, it sets up and then subverts your expectations several times in rapid succession. Dramatic music, beautiful framing, and it's a tiny little boat with one sail that he's having to bail out with a bucket. The salute to the dead pirates hammers home that he is also a pirate, which you expected, but it also contains compassion and respect for the dead, which perhaps you didn't. Everyone turning to look because Jack is a consummate show-off, but they're not looking because he's so impressive. And then that beautiful mast hop from the sunken ship, gorgeous. We follow this with him paying off the guy at the dock so he doesn't have to give a name, and then immediately committing petty thievery and lifting a purse which probably has more money in it than he just gave that guy. Jack is a dashing rogue, but he's also the butt monkey. He is a stinkier Han Solo with an even shakier moral compass. He thinks he's cool. He is, at best, intermittently cool. Murphy's Law loves Jack too much for all of his schemes to work all of the time. And he's not as clever as he thinks he is, but he is clever and intermittently heroic. So having established these two characters, now we're going to pit them against each other. About 20 minutes in, having saved Elizabeth and been captured by Norrington, Captain Jack makes a daring escape and sneaks into the blacksmith shop to free himself from the irons on his wrists. He is interrupted by Will, who correctly concludes that he is the pirate the entire garrison is looking for, and they fight. The music, the choreography, the stunt work, the character moments, the props. It's gorgeous. Particularly the character moments, because we don't know these characters very well yet, but everything we're about to see will gel with the things that we've already learned. The thing is, it could have looked and sounded great, and still have been hollow. Fight scenes in movies should be there to serve the story, but it's entirely possible just to have a bunch of entertaining things happen which don't really tell us very much at all. Topic for another day, perhaps. But I prefer more meat on the bones of my fights, so let's get to it. We have Jack, we have Will, we have their environment, we have clear and conflicting objectives for each of them. Will must capture Jack, Jack must escape from Will. We have their characters which they must stay true to during the fight, and the choreography is flashy and exciting and just the right amount of ridiculous. Because the characters are taking this fight seriously, but that doesn't mean that the audience should. Jack's journey in Curse of the Black Pearl is the price of being a bad man and the consequences of listening to your conscience. Jack would be a whole lot more successful and a whole lot less interesting if he consistently did the selfish thing. But the conflict is what makes him interesting. I mean, he could have just used the distraction of Elizabeth falling off the cliff to push these two guys, neither of whom can swim, into the water and make good his escape on the interceptor. He could have shot Will at the end of the duel and made good his escape from there. But that would be a bit one note. No. Will's journey in Curse of the Black Pearl is about the price of being a good man, and the consequences of following your heart when things aren't quite what they seem. And so it goes. We begin as Jack escapes from his irons with Will being a tidy freak and caring for an unconscious drunken master. 
who is probably the closest thing to family that he has. And Jack threatens Will with a sword because nobody touches the hat. The type of sword Jack's using is called a hanger, which is basically a slightly longer version of a cutlass. Cutlasses were basically the sword of choice for sailors of all varieties because they weren't as long and unwieldy as rapiers, which is useful when you're on a ship. Jack probably does more fighting than rope cutting though, so I suppose he'd want the extra length of a hanger. No jokes, please. Jack's sword is also in a state, rather like the rest of him. Look at it, is it even sharp? If he cut you with it, would you die of blood loss or tetanus first? Say thank you to the props and costume and hair and makeup departments. Jack Sparrow is a has-been pirate who smells really bad and sailed into Port Royal on a tiny sinking boat. Of course his gear is looking worse for wear. Will, by contrast, grabs one of the many swords that he has made. Like all of them, it is new and shiny, but this particular one is his. So it's not... Gold filigree laid into the handle. But it is very Will. You've got your cast iron grip, you've got your half basket hilt to protect your fingers, but most of all, it's Will's sword. And swords are for cutting and fighting and things, so it does what it does without any particular flash, but it does it well. Much like Will, it's well made and well maintained, but there's nothing expensively fancy about it. And we haven't even started fighting yet. Time for some talking, so that Jack can try and psych out his opponent. Do you think this is wise, boy? While Will is just very focused on the whole Elizabeth thing. When we actually begin the fight, we learn a couple of things very quickly. First, that the neat, precise personality that means he knows exactly where his hammer should be, no jokes please, carries over to Will's fencing style. Second, that after a very short time, Jack knows that Will is pretty good at this sword fighting thing. You know what you're doing, I'll give you that. Excellent form. Around here, we call the sections into which fights are divided phrases, and a phrase ends anytime there is a pause, and you can use that pause just as a pause, or you can consider your next move, which will of course be in time to the music, or you can swish your sword around like your Anakin Skywalker, or whatever. And generally, fights are learned section by section, phrase by phrase, because otherwise, if you tried to learn it all at once, you'd just get very confused. Jack attacks and advances and is parried. Jack attacks and advances for a longer phrase and is parried. Will has hit the steps and can't back up further, so swipes at him instead. Then we reverse and do a similar thing in the opposite direction. Jack has been feeling out Will's defense, and now we see what Will is like on the attack. And he is pretty good. This being established, what do we already know about Jack? Well, that he's tricky. Considering his human corkscrew of a personality, it would be weird for him to just have a straight fight. So. How's your footwork? Will is a very by-the-book fencer, and he knows the correct response to Jack's footwork, and Jack is relying on this lawful good tendency of Will's to get him to the door. At this point, we reinforce Will's basically a decent human being character by having him lock the door with the sword rather than cleave Jack's head in two. So now Jack can't escape, and it's here that we get into a more environmentally conscious fight. Not, not that kind of environmentally conscious. I mean that we're not just going back and forth across the floor with swords anymore. Will grabs the poker, Jack is looking for an escape and so they're having to fight around the pillar, Jack uses the remains of his irons to try and catch Will's hand, Will dives into the wheel out of the way, they each grab more weapons, and we learn something more about Will. Who makes all these? I do! Well, we kind of already guessed that from his reaction to Governor Swan saying, extend my compliments to your master. Yeah, that guy. But still, it's nice to have reinforcement of the point. And he practices with them three hours a day. Which would neatly explain why Jack Sparrow, pirate and presumably no slouch with a sword because, you know, he's still alive, is not making much headway. And also, it's Will's workshop. The camera circling around and being blocked by various pieces of the set helps to establish that they are in a clearly defined and not terribly large space, which helps to obscure when it's a stuntman fighting, but also adds to the complexity, which increases the tension and makes it more exciting. The best fights are stories within a story, and so they should have arcs of their own. Fights which are one note are very boring, but there are a multitude of ways to spice things up, and two of those ways are to either increase or decrease the level of complexity in the fight as you go on. My first stage combat exam was three exams back to back, so both partners started with rapier and dagger, and then by some means both of us were disarmed down to our single swords and then both of us were disarmed down to just being unarmed and fighting hand to hand and then we were done. Which is a pretty convenient way of combining your three exams into one. Fights getting less complex as you go through is pretty realistic because 
the characters would be getting tired and more sloppy, and so you can make it feel realistic or gritty or intimate or tense. The other way to increase the tension is to make things more complex as we go on. Pacific Rim's bow staff fight between Mako and Rally gets more complex as it progresses, each phrase longer than the last, to emphasise their increasing connection. In this fight, we increase the complexity with changes in the environment and weapons, which works perfectly for a summer blockbuster designed to entertain you. And we cram in some more character moments too. Perhaps the reason you practice three hours a day is that you already found one and are otherwise incapable of wooing said Strumpers. Ouch, Jack. Followed by another change in environment, this time to the wagon seesaw, which is both ridiculous and entertaining. Two character points for Will here. One, Will talks a good game about meeting pirates and killing them, but given the opportunity, he still doesn't kill Jack. He chains him up. He loves Elizabeth, and that remark was a little close to the bone, but he's still not a killer by nature. Two, when he gets flung up into the rafters, our fourth environment, if you're counting, he chooses to bring Jack up to him instead of jumping down. He chooses to stay in the place favouring him with his very careful footwork over Jack, who has more experience fighting actual opponents than Will, but also looks like balance could be an issue for him. Will disarms Jack again, but having got back down to the ground, Jack ends the fight quite decisively with a combination of cocoa powder? and a pistol. I know they used cocoa powder for this, but I've legitimately no idea what it was meant to represent. Clay? I don't know. Distracted, sorry. We then end with Jack's refusal to use his pistol on Will, the closest thing to a guiding moral that Jack has at this point, and then having established that Jack is not completely heartless, we end with the anticlimax of Mr. Brown smashing him over the head with a bottle. The anticlimax serves a few purposes. First, the removal of Jack's agency, do I shoot Will or don't I, reminds us that Jack is only intermittently cool. It reinforces that Will, regardless of how good or clever or skilled he is, never gets the credit, and it delays a crucial character moment until the right point in the story. We need Jack to make a decisive character choice at a pivotal moment and we're not there yet. It also plants a seed of doubt in Will's head about Jack's moral status. Jack could have killed him, but he didn't. He asked him to move. It was very nearly pleading. It was not what Will expected from a pirate who might also sometimes be a good man. This scene is what it is and what it is is darn near perfect. It's a small-scale fight with imaginative use of setting, executed well with clear objectives for everyone. It's fun, it's dramatic, it makes use of four different parts of a relatively small set, and the sword clashes are in time with the music, which is also some really excellent music. There are lots of flashier, more expensive, more complicated fight scenes in the Pirates franchise, but honestly for sheer craftsmanship, this one's probably my favourite. For more videos on storytelling using fights you should subscribe here, and you should look for more videos to watch here. Probably. Thanks to my patrons who make this show possible, and I'll see you all next time.